Hobart and William Smith Colleges community. It is my honor to officially proclaim the 2016-2017 academic year open. Colleagues and returning students, welcome. And a special welcome to the classes of 2020. To open today's ceremony, please welcome Chaplain Maurice Charles. Please be seated. Welcome to the threshold of a brand new academic year. Classes of 2020, welcome. Congratulations on your acceptance to Hobart and William Smith Colleges, and thank you for accepting us. 2020. 20 years ago, in a university far, far away, a brand new chaplain started his academic year with a phone call from his mother. In the middle of the excitement about giving his first public address, his mother interrupted with the words, Oh, how wonderful. I am so proud of you. Now you just tell those young people what that Bible says. Wait a minute, Bob. I just can't get on stage and start quoting the Bible at people. This is an institution of higher learning. We have agnostics, atheists, Baha'is, Buddhists, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Jews, people from all over the world. Oh, that sounds fascinating. I wish I could be there with you. Well, then, you just tell those young people what that Bible says. I could see her lifting her finger even at a distance and enunciating her words for dramatic effect. Just tell them, with all thy getting, get understanding. Mother often quoted this text from Hebrew scriptures, Proverbs 4, 7 to be exact, whenever my siblings and I locked horns, or when we gathered at the family dinner table engaged in lively debate, and we staked out our positions and would not budge. Whenever I would dismiss someone else's viewpoint, or worse, dismiss another person out of hand, she would raise a finger in the air with the words, with all thy getting, get understanding. Hers was an invitation to listen more carefully, think more deeply, take the time to discern between what someone meant to say and one's own knee-jerk reaction. Her advice, I think, has served me well over the years and afforded me the rare privilege of being able to move freely between communities. Every year, this community renews itself. That's the wonderful thing about colleges and universities. So welcome everyone to your new community. This is a rare and privileged space for getting understanding. Those of you who are new here, new faculty, students and staff, you will find many people here who have dedicated our lives to getting understanding, to understanding you. Each and every one of you belongs here. Our doors, our hearts, and often even our homes are open to you in the days and years ahead. And now it is my singular honor to add to my welcome, a welcome to this podium, the officiant of this ceremony, President Mark D. Guerin. Reverend Charles, Board of Trustees Chair Tom Bizzuto, Student Trustees Zach Groton and Sidney Gomez, Provost Ufamata, Deans Baer and Gallowet, Professors Kinney and Ahrens, Student Government Presidents Mary Kabinsky and Matthew Skinner, and our own very special guest from the Hobart Class of 1983, Dr. Gregory Vincent. Welcome to convocation, especially the classes of 2020, and to the members of our faculty and staff that are join us. This is the first day of classes, and we are intentionally called together for a convocation from the Latin convocare, which is to call and to come together. We come together as a community with remarks from our board of trustees, faculty, and students, and a distinguished invited speaker. And today, 
we remind ourselves and we commit ourselves to excellence and effort in the classroom, the lab, performance venues, on the field, the court, ice or pool, with student groups and clubs in Geneva and around the world. And so I open these exercises of convocation filled with great excitement for the year ahead, filled with gratitude for my own time here at Hobart and William Smith, filled with confidence in the importance of our mission, with respect for our governing board of trustees, with appreciation for the commitment of our faculty, with indebtedness to our staff, and with high regard for the talents and commitments of Hobart and William Smith students and alumni and alumni who so enrich our lives and our community. But before I call forth our board chair, allow me one brief presidential prerogative. For 35 years ago today, in exactly two hours, I married Mary Herlihy. It was a brilliant strategic decision. So, happy anniversary, Mary. I've convened this nice, romantic, intimate crowd of 600 of our new best friends here. Happy 35th, I've thought of everything. But now, it gives me great pleasure to call forth the Board of Trustees of Hobart and William Smith, Mr. Tom Bizzuto, from the class of 1968. Many of you will know him as, well, a, um, a boathouse, let's be frank. But I can attest he is much, much more than that. Although, Tom, I think I can speak for all Hobart and William Smith sailors, those who utilize the Bizzuto Boathouse for yoga, for reflection, for sunning, or just yesterday, simply jumping into the refreshing Seneca Lake, we thank you for that beautiful space named to honor your late father. So while some in this community may not have the fullness of his experience on our board, in the coming years, our community will get to know him very, very well as the new chair of our board of trustees. Hobart and William Smith has been very fortunate to have his volunteer service on our board for 17 years, chairing important committees, engaging alums in his home in Baltimore and Washington. And at every meeting for the past 17 years with our board of trustees, I have always appreciated his thoughtful engagement. But this year, by a unanimous vote of the board of trustees, his fellow trustees, he takes the helm as chair of the board. And in my view, we could not be more fortunate to have his considerable skills at work on our behalf. A successful entrepreneur who built a business on integrity going back to 1988. Along the way, he raised a family with his wife, Barbara, and devoted many hours of volunteer service to his hometown of Baltimore. And he has always, always remained true to his alma mater. The first in his family to go to college, he went on to take his Hobart degree, serve our nation in the military, earn graduate training, and jumped head, heart, and feet first into building his business. And so this year, with all that's before us, with the importance of strategic thinking and planning for the future, in my view, there is no better thinker or doer than to have Tom Bizzuto as our chair of the Board of Trustees. So join me in welcoming and thanking this former resident of Cheryl Hall. Cheryl Hall? This former RA of Medbury in Hale Hall. Medbury Hale? Go get him. Get back here. This former Saga employee, and now our current chair of the Board of Trustees, Mr. Tom Bazuno. Thank you, President Karen. That was very generous. He, uh, one thing he failed to mention is that I am the former roommate of Mike Hanna. Um, and thank you also, Chaplain Charles, Dr. Gregory Vincent, Provost 
Ufamata, the deans, our student trustees and government leaders and all faculty, staff, students, and attendants. I'd also like to offer a special welcome and thanks to Mary Guerin, whose kindness and generosity are well known to everyone in our community. Mary, thank you for everything you do. We all love you. To the classes of 2020, welcome. Despite the gap in age between us, we are all similarly situated. I know you look at me and think I look like someone's grandfather, and I am. But like you, I too have the great privilege of being a first year. You see, although I've been connected to the colleges for more than 50 years, these are the first days of my tenure as chair of the Board of Trustees. And in these first days, I've been hit with tasks I've never encountered before. Chief among them, having to bid farewell and find a replacement for the man I think to be the best president in higher education in America today. Please join me in acknowledging our great president, Mark Guerin. Like many of my fellow first years, I'm still learning the lay of the land and the responsibilities of my new role. I sometimes describe myself as feeling like a fish swimming in jello. But what a wonderful position for all of us to be in. To have new experiences that test our intellectual agility that demand that we grow emotionally and that require us to see the world in new ways. This, for me and for all of you, is an extraordinary learning opportunity. One of the great things about a Hobart and William Smith education is that it teaches you to become a perpetual or permanent student. In my life, I've tried to always be in a state of learning. In my business, I've always surrounded myself with people who are more intelligent and creative than I am, with ideas and books that challenge and stimulate me. My career has been focused almost entirely on creating housing, quality housing and rental communities that give residents what I like to think of as a place of sanctuary. As a result, I have been chiefly concerned for the past 40 years with one basic question. How do you build community? How do you create community? What makes one community thrive and another fail? How can people use space to increase positive interactions? How do you create environments that allow individual opportunities for quiet reflection and learning, and that also allow groups of people to gather for celebration and social gatherings? What fundamentally makes a home? What I've found is that space and place do matter. Fortunately, here on the shore of Seneca Lake, you have entered a space and a place that will value you, that will give you the tools to succeed in whatever academic pursuits and career you can imagine, that will challenge you and support you. This is a 
community. This is an environment, a home, where your talents can shine. In return for admittance, we expect that you give of yourself wholly to the community and to your studies, to your friendships and to your future. We expect you to learn. I hope that you take advantage of everything the colleges have to offer. And should there ever come a moment when you don't feel supported or confident, a moment when you begin to think you don't fit in. And believe me, that will happen for many of you, it happened to me. Then reach out to those around you for advice and mentorship. These faculty members and the staff here at the colleges thrive on being close to students. Reach out to them, don't be intimidated by them. They are here for them. That's what makes this a community. You see, we have built community here at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. One of great value and one that makes us all proud. Welcome to our community. Thank you very much. In past years, Convocation speakers represent a broad array of professional fields. Some alums, some not. Social entrepreneurs, like the founder of the creative group Kaboom, building playgrounds around the country. The founder of Donors Choose, Charles Best, or the head of direct relief, Thomas Tighe. Writers and public intellectuals, like the executive editor of The New Yorker, Dorothy Wickenden, or the writer on civic engagement, Eric Liu. Those from the arts and medicine, like the actor Chris McDonald, or the famous AIDS, AIDS researcher, Chris Byer, or the founder of the nurse practitioner movement, Loretta Ford. Faith leaders, like Bishop Barbara Harris, the first woman ordained a bishop in the Anglican community. In public servants, like AmeriCorps director Rosie Mock, the first woman Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, or civil rights icon, Congressman John Lewis. And into that illustrious group and pantheon of great women and men, we today welcome a son of Hobart, Dr. Gregory Vincent. His bio is before you, and I will not rehearse the details, but I would encourage you to read of his notable accomplishments. But I invited Greg Vincent here to speak with us today because of what we talk a lot about here at Hobart and William Smith, a life of consequence. For not too long ago, he was sitting right where you are. He studied economics and history here, played basketball, ran cross country. And despite his father's hope that he would utilize his math and science skills as an engineer, he went off to law school with his passion for civil rights law. He served as the public as an assistant attorney general and then turned his attention to higher education. So he is at the center of national issues involving higher education and is a respected thought leader of civic engagement. And so for all these reasons, we welcome back our distinguished alum, this former resident of Geneva Hall, this RA at Hale Bartlett and Durfee, this proud statesman, our 2016 convocation speaker, Dr. Gregory Vincent from the Hobart class of 1983. Good evening to Chairman Mazzuto, President Guerin, faculty, alumni, staff, parents, guests, and students. Thank you all for allowing me to be part of your 2016 fall convocation. I'm especially grateful as I look out in the audience that I see my class and teammates, Mark Pitifer and uh, Jamie Matthews, and two big brothers to me that when I entered and joined this campus as a very young 17-year-old, they took me under their wings, and I'm so glad that they're here today. My big brothers, uh, John Cromartie and 
Jeff Benjamin. So I'm so glad that they're, they're here today. And I'm glad that uh, my fraternity brothers from Rochester came down as well. And as President uh, Guerin mentioned, uh, I do serve at the University of Texas at Austin uh, since 2005, both as a vice president and as a professor. But most importantly, I am a statesman and a proud alum of Hobart and William Smith Colleges. It is great to be back here in the Finger Lakes region of New York. There is nothing that can equal Geneva when summer turns to fall and the colors begin to change. I want to begin by both congratulating and celebrating the tenure and legacy of President Mark Guerin. His time at the helm of Hobart and William Smith Colleges is one we rarely see in higher education, one that achieves both greatness and longevity. In a time when a four or five year presidency is considered normal, President Guerin has held the position of president of Hobart and William Smith Colleges since the class of 2020, all of you were just learning how to walk. Think about how rare that is in this day and age. At the conclusion of this year, he will leave after serving for 18 years and his legacy will live on through all of you. His final incoming first year class, which I understand is the strongest ever assembled. But Jamie, we know this has saved the most herald, heralded game-changing class of 1983. Whether it be increased fundraising, growing opportunities for students, both academically and financially, physically expanding the campus, or deepening the commitments to environmental sustainability, diversity, inclusion, and civic engagement, President Guerin took great and made it better. It is due to his leadership that I became a member of the Wheeler Society, invested in the Statesman Athletic Association, and endowed a scholarship at HWS. I speak for all of us, alumni, students, faculty, staff, and the community, when I say thank you for your dedicated service to our institution, and we wish you all the best next fall in your new role as president in residence at Harvard University Graduate School of Education. Your presence and calm demeanor will be, be missed forever here in Geneva. And Mary, congratulations on your anniversary, and we know that we will miss you and your family as well. Thank you for all you have done. Hobart and William Smith changed my life. I'm sure when you all reach my age, many of you will be saying the same. I grew up in New York City, grandson to West Indian immigrants and son to an amazing mother and father. As a first generation American and college student, my father served in one of the last racially segregated units in the army during the Korean War and then used the GI Bill to earn a degree at the City College of New York. And after graduating, he enjoyed a 35-year career as a professional electrical engineer with General Electric and the New York City Transit Authority. My mother went on to earn her master's degree while also taking care of her elderly parents, raising three children, and serving on our community school board for 13 years. When she was first elected to the board in 1970, five years after the 1965 Voting Rights Act, she was one of only 1,400 African-American elected officials in the country. Needless to say, I was raised in a strong community where public service and social justice went hand in hand, that more should always be done for the betterment of all. Growing up, my parents gave me three priceless gifts. One was unconditional love. Two was a love of reading. And in this pre-internet era, one of my favorite memories was 
uh, spending hours flipping through the pages of our set of encyclopedias. And third was our church home. Dr. Charles, you should know that like my parents, like my grandparents and great-grandparents are lifelong members of the Episcopal Church and the Anglican community. And I will always be grateful for this foundation. My upbringing relied heavily on my faith and my religious community. I never heard conflicting messages growing up. What I heard in church was what I heard at home and vice versa. It was my religious community that taught me about the value of diversity in building community. And that selflessness is the key to making the greatest impact. So over and over I heard the message, get involved, be engaged. Get involved, be engaged. This was my worldview when I first stepped foot on campus in 1979. In fact, it was the rector of my church that introduced me and wrote my recommendation to Hobart College. Thankfully, I only heard more of the same in Geneva, and because of that, Hobart and William Smith laid the foundation for my life of consequence. With the rest of my time, I want to reflect on three pieces of advice, which is the same advice I gave my own children from my perspective as a parent, college administrator, and professor, and for some of you as a law and graduate school admissions committee member. First of all, and this should be no trouble for all, be yourselves. I'm sure you've heard this adage, but no two snowflakes are the same, which is also true of all of you. We're all unique and different for a reason. This is how it is intended that we be. The point is to build your own path and follow your passion. Don't settle on a major just because. As President Guerin mentioned, my father wanted me to be an engineer, but that was not my passion. Instead, do what is passionate for you. You are a class with an average GPA of 3.5, representing 28 states and 16 countries from across the globe, from South Africa to China, to Ecuador, to India. You are all high achievers. Strive for greatness, be you, and study what you love. I knew from a young age that I wanted to be an agent for social change and follow in the footsteps of my parents and my childhood hero, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. Working to achieve that dream has always been my driving force. Figure out what it is for you, what excites and engages you, and pursue it. Fulfilling that passion transitions into my second piece of advice. Challenge yourselves to own this place. You self-selected to attend a liberal arts college to earn a degree that forces you to explore and adapt to areas of study you are not comfortable with. That is a given. It is now up to you to get out of your comfort zone and make good on your investment. Pursue research, get into debate, ask questions, and to hearken back to my first piece of advice, follow your passion. Literally, get to know every inch of this beautiful campus. I had a time of my life as a student here and, and have created lifelong friends, as I mentioned, who are here today. I'm still close with my freshman year residence hall mates, none of whom I knew before arriving here on campus. I was willing to put myself out there and it paid off for me, just as it will for all of you. I also encourage you to get involved with the community. I had the wonderful opportunity to learn more about Geneva 2020 and I can share with you that Hobart and William Smith is an exemplar in higher education and I encourage you to get actively involved in the Geneva community. And although Hobart and William Smith colleges are private, they have become fierce advocates and take education and make it a public good. Like the University of Texas, Hobart and William Smith is a leader among higher education institutions when it comes to community service and civic engagement. 
Each year, Hobart and William Smith students contribute more than 80,000 hours to local, national, and international communities. By the time you graduate, nearly all of you will have participated in, in service in some form, and most of you will have made it a part of your daily life. I know that it was true for me. Owning this place also means not shying away from opportunities available to you away from campus. Hobart and William Smith Colleges are national leaders in both off-campus study and internship placement. Career services so strongly in the importance of internships that it literally guarantees one to every student on campus in good academic and social standing who completes the Pathways program with placements at HBO, J.P. Morgan Chase, American Red Cross, and Condé Nast. This is an opportunity that each of you should take advantage of and work toward starting today. My daughter Camille is a 2014 graduate of Spelman College and works at the National Park Service Southeast Regional Office in Atlanta and previously worked as a park ranger and Teach for America uh, uh, participant at the Dr. Dr. Martin King National Site. Both appointments are a direct result of her two-year internship with the National Park Service as an undergrad. The same goes for study abroad. The colleges are known for their commitment to global study, and with abroad programs in six continents, I assure you there's a program to fit your specific incident, uh, interest. My son Greg is a 2015 graduate of UT Austin, and he interned and now results at, at Procter & Procter & Gamble as a direct result of his study abroad experience in Beijing, China. While, competing my, while completing my doctorate, I studied abroad in the Czech Republic, and it was one of the most transformational experiences of my life. The experience of studying abroad changes your outlook on life, knowledge of world issues, and how you understand your own cultural identity all of which contribute to making you a more complete global citizen and a more attractive job applicant. Like interning, choosing to study off campus is an experience I promise you will not regret. And finally, build your own board of directors. Your board should consist of those invested in your success. Of course, these should include close family and friends, but it must not end there. You are provided an invaluable gift at the colleges, a very advantageous faculty to student ratio. Get to know your professors on a more personal level, interact with them, ask questions, develop relationships, offer them to take them out to coffee. Your professors could teach anywhere, but they chose to be here for a very important reason. You inspire them. Dean Clarence Butler, economics professor William Waller, Professor Emeritus Chris Gunn, and many others who are not only my campus mentors, but through the years, and we've become very close friends as well. I took intro to economics with Professor Gunn, which led to several advanced economics courses, which led to a foundation for the relationship I share with him today. And because we had gotten to know one another outside of the classroom, Professor Gunn became one of my board members and was able to author one of my most impactful law and graduate school letters of reference. Similarly, when I decided to transition from law to higher education, Dean Clarence Butler, who I sought out to gauge his opinion and ask questions, was another board member. We discussed where I could make the greatest impact on the issues of access and equity, and it was because of his guidance that I ended up at the University of Wisconsin-Madison to start my career both as an administrator and as a faculty member. So that's my advice. For those simple, my hope is that you keep these principles in mind as you begin your collegiate careers. Be a snowflake, follow your passion, own the place, build a board of directors. I'm gonna end with a story. And this is a story I've shared with only a few. But in thinking about the importance of today, I felt it was time it met a larger audience. 
At graduation, just, just a little further down the campus, I was awarded the Dr. Martin Luther King Leadership Award. I was grateful for the honor, but felt uncomfortable accepting it. Simply, I believed I hadn't done enough to deserve it. Like Justice Marshall, Dr. King was another one of my heroes, and the award was not one I took lightly. It really hit me as I was filling out my law school applications to the point where I almost included my undeserved feelings and lack of consequence in my personal statement. In the end, I had a moment of clarity, and rather than exposing my true feelings, I made a promise to myself that I would devote my life and career, my literal, literal life of consequence, toward making that honor true, to honor those that saw and believed in me my most, my family and my mentors. And at 54, this is still a work in progress, and I feel I am just now beginning to earn what I was given more than three decades ago. The blueprint to living a life of consequence is not one that can be microwaved. Once I completed law school, I served as an assistant attorney general of Ohio. It was all that I ever wanted to do. I was able to successfully argue major civil rights cases before the Ohio, civil rights, uh, the Ohio Supreme Court, and it was not long before I was promoted to legal and regional affairs director for the Ohio Civil Rights Commission. I was a young attorney following in Justice Marshall's footsteps, doing exactly what I had dreamed of, but how quickly things changed. I was a prosecuting a housing discrimination case in Cincinnati where the complainant was denied an apartment because she was black. Despite having substantial application, solid references, and steady employment, it was an open and shut case, which we won. But you wouldn't know that by looking into the eyes of the complainant. She was broken after having been forced to defend her self-worth in the court of law, a picture I could never erase from my mind. The harm to dignity was heartbreaking, but it was also life-changing. It was my aha moment. Long story short, in that moment, I realized that my greatest impact would not be in the courtroom, but at a university. And as mentioned, I went on to get my doctorate and wanted to reach out uh, to get in front of those issues before they arose and impact the younger generation. So I transitioned to higher education, where I would have the opportunity to reach thousands of students, maximizing the potential and positive impact for change. This point is all more important given today's cultural climate. I've spent the last eight years helping to defend my university's constitutional right to consider race amid a holistic admissions review. As I hope most of you are aware, in June, the Supreme Court ruled in our favor, affirming deference to academic freedom. For me, the implications of Fisher is less about admission standards and more how do we break down stereotypes and progress hand in hand with those from all cultures and walks of life. I believe the change must start at our colleges and universities, the place where many of our students confront those that look different than themselves for the first time in their lives. In this unique four-year experience where young people have the opportunity to come together in meaningful ways, learning to work with one another and interact with one another, be that in the classrooms and dining halls or the residence halls or off campus, this is why I so strongly believe and challenging you all to get out of your comfort zones because I believe it's the fastest and most effective way toward eliminating, eliminating the barriers I previously encountered in Ohio not that long ago. But I can't do it alone. I need all of you. So that is the path that led my, to my life of consequence. What will yours be? The University, has a tag, University of Texas has a tagline, what starts here changes the world, which I believe is appropriate for all of you as well. Your class will have the opportunity to change the world, to, 
you all have the opportunity to live lives of consequence. We are in a moment in time where many great issues have come to a head, be it scientific, political, or social. This is a responsibility that you face in this generation. I have faith in all of you. You are our future, a generation with great moral aptitude, which values itself and is unafraid to speak up for what you believe in. My parents were big believers in the golden rule, treat others as we wish to be treated. It's vital that given in our ever divided culture, we re reject divisiveness and we honor that golden rule. What I challenge all of you is to never lose sight of what will take you to live a life of consequence. I know that you all have that in you. Don't hesitate to look to your peers and mentors here at the colleges to help you get there. Thank you all again, and I wish you all the best. You all inspire me, fill me with hope, and make me proud to be a Hobart and William Smith alum. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Vincent, for that inspiring talk, and I mean it. As the Dean of Hobart College, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the Hobart student speaker. Each spring semester, students elect one rising junior from each of the colleges to serve as a non-voting member of the Board of Trustees for one academic year. In their senior year, student trustees become voting members of the Board. This year, that Hobart student is Zach Grattan, whom I have had the pleasure of knowing since his first year on campus. A senior from Ware, New Hampshire, Zach is double majoring in international relations and religious studies. He's a member of Phi Beta Kappa, has studied in Germany and Japan, and is a member of the Hobart basketball team. Zach. Thank you, Dean Bear. Good evening, everyone. This is our song. This is our story. What will it be? What will you contribute to it? I recently had the pleasure of listening to Wynton Marsalis, the founder and head of Jazz at Lincoln Center, speak. I won't stand up here and act like I know much about jazz. I won't act like you guys do either. However, as I listened to Marcellus speak more and more, I could not help but try to understand this type of music in terms of my own life. What I came to grasp was that all of us here today are not so different from a band. In front of you, you can find your drummers, those who will give you your deadlines, your beat. Between each hit of the drum, each due date, you will be given moments to fill with creativity, rises and falls, discoveries that you can only make in a place like this. Your professors will be the backbone to your song, but you will be its music. You may not know yet what your role will be here, but rest assured, you will contribute to this place. Without you, the experience of this place would be decidedly changed for those around you. In jazz, there is often no plan to what will occur during the course of a song, and often the plan changes throughout the course of the song itself. What is clear is that each song is unique and influenced by the talent, the imagination, and the passion of each musician, each player, each student. Every song and story is interconnected in ways we cannot foresee and may not fully understand in the moment, but each note, each choice will unquestionably leave its mark. For me, this dynamic is abundantly clear in the classroom. When everyone is knowledgeable, passionate, and prepared, the class becomes something different. Participation is not forced, rather celebrated and natural. As a first-year student sitting in Professor Cerulli's Buddhism course, 
I learned that contributing in your own way is one of the most powerful things you can do here. You may not know it, but everyone around you will be better for it. After all, this is your song, your story. This is your life of consequence. Welcome, HWS classes of 2020. As the Dean of William Smith College, it is my honor to introduce Sidney Gomez, Willie Smith student trustee. Like Zach, Sidney is a voting member of the Board of Trustees. From New York City and majoring in psychology, Sidney is very involved with campus leadership roles. She's artistic director of Sankofa, works in publicity for the Office of Student Affairs, and is a member of Mosaic, the social justice theater group. Ladies and gentlemen, Sidney Gomez. Thank you to the deans, Chaplain Charles, Chair of the Board, Tom Bizzuto, and Dr. Gregory Vincent. And thank you, President Guerin, for inviting me to speak today. Congratulations, classes of 2020. You did it. You made it through the long orientation weekend, and you finished your first, week of, first day of college classes. Three years ago, around this time, I remember my mother dropping me off and our goodbye right here on Stern Lawn. She was bawling her eyes out, and I played as a national at college student who was ready for her to leave. But deep down, I was trying not to cry. I was in the same place you are today, filled with mixed emotions, excited to start a new journey, unsure of my future, anxious to meet new people, and terrified it all wasn't going to work. And let me tell you, it works out. I found my home here at HWS, through the support of my family, friends, faculty, staff, and administrators. I took the leap of faith by running for student trustee. I've learned new and old things while abroad in Spain. I joined Sankofa, the Black Students' Union, and Mosaic New York, our social justice theater company. I tutored with America Reads at West Street Elementary, and I DJ for a radio station, WHWS. I did this all because I had nothing to lose but a lot to gain. If I can do it, so can you. No one is stopping you. Only you can get in the way. I know this firsthand because I'm my big, biggest critic. So here's my advice to you as you begin your journey at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. I encourage you to take advantage of all the endless opportunities here. Go abroad, start a club, join one, take an acting class, get out of your comfort zone. And you will fail, but that's okay, because through failure comes strength, knowledge, and success. I encourage you to admit to what you do not know or do not understand, to be able to say, I need help, because there will always be someone here, whether that be faculty, staff, administration, or me. I'm here for you, so talk to me, ask questions, and we can even do lunch if you want. I want you to have conversations with people from different backgrounds and lived experiences. You'll find that you have more in common than you thought, and you'll have differing opinions, which is the best part, because it will make the conversation all the more worthwhile. As President Guerin says, reasonable people, reasonable people can disagree. Lastly, I want you to know that everything will be okay. This is just the beginning, and although you may feel scared, nervous, and unsure, it all works out, and you find your place here. You find home. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. I'm Titi Ufomata and I have the great privilege of serving as provost and dean of faculty at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor of Geoscience, Nan Cristo Arons, the 2015-2016 recipient of the faculty prize for scholarship. Professor Arons earned her bachelor's and master's degrees from Pennsylvania State University, where she studied earth science and English as an undergraduate. And 
invertebrate paleontology as a graduate student. She went on to earn her master's and PhD in biology from Harvard University. Crossing, crossing between geoscience, biology, chemistry, and environmental science, her current research focuses on the evolution of terrestrial environments as well as phenomena connecting as atmospheric, climate, and vegetation-related evolution. She has presented more than 40 professional papers and published more than 30 scholarly articles and nearly as many magazine articles, encyclopedia entries, and book reviews, often collaborating with student scientists. She has been awarded research grants from the National Geographic Society, the American Chemical Society, the Helmer Foundation Research, and the National Science Foundation, among others which have funded research around the world from Appalachia to South America and the Caribbean to Australia. She's a member of Phi Beta Kappa and previously chaired the Hobart and William Smith Committee on Faculty. She leads the Seneca Roots and Shoots Environmental After School Program for the Boys and Girls Club of Geneva and this year is the faculty advisor to Parsi Four. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Ahrens. Holy cow. All right, just between you and me, I am not supposed to be here. The faculty remarks at convocation are typically given by the winner of the annual teaching prize. I didn't win that award. I've never won that award. The 2016 winner of the teaching prize is a member of the dance department, an exceptional teacher artist, Professor Cadence Whittier. She is such an effective and innovative teacher that a publishing house recently asked her to write a book detailing her unique method for teaching ballet. Her teaching is that extraordinary. You should try really, really, really hard to take a class with her. But you say, I am not interested in dance. It's not my thing. My thing is fill in the blank. Go fill in the blank and hold that thought. Colleagues, if you will indulge me for a moment, if you are teaching this semester, if you are in the classroom in any capacity, please stand up and face the students. Students, I want you to take a good look at the people standing before you. Look for somebody interesting. <laughs> somebody you're curious about. We're all very colorful. Someone you are keen to get to know. Some of these folks probably know a whole lot about that thing that you're interested in. Remember I just asked you to fill in the blank? Find them. You may have had great high school teachers. I don't doubt that you did. But these aren't your high school teachers on steroids. Every one of these folks is a leading expert in their field. They aren't just teaching you what they've learned. They are creating new knowledge and sharing it with you right here, right now. And you can be part of it if you want to. More importantly, 
every single person standing before you has dedicated their life to teaching. We have a passion for ideas, all kinds of crazy ideas, and we love getting you to be passionate about ideas too. Thank you, colleagues. You may be seated. All summer long, people have probably been asking you, so what are you going to study in college? Some of you may have answered with sincere conviction. Some of you have made something up because you have no idea yet. When I was in your shoes, I answered with great conviction. Journalism. I am going to be a journalist. Daily print, by the way. I graduated five years later with a degree in earth science. College is like that. I was transformed. Right now, it doesn't matter at all what you want to study. If your mind and heart are open, you'll figure it out, don't worry. But here's what does matter. Why are you here? Oh, 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 Professor Arns, I know to learn. Or perhaps, to have a really good time before adulthood really sets in. That should have gotten a laugh. Come on, guys. <laughs> nope. You are here to transform. Some of those folks that you looked at a few minutes ago are going to blow your mind wide open if you let them. If you let them, you won't see anything about the world the same way ever again. If you take a, a chance on study abroad, you won't return the same person. If you get involved in sports, in clubs, in service, in leadership, in the arts, in activism, you will meet people who will help you discover a passion you don't even know you have yet. If you try research, you may discover something that changes how we all see the world. That's cool. Are you ready to be transformed? Are you ready to transform? It's going to be a wild ride, guaranteed. Some amazing highs some tears, some stress, and some fear. Yeah, fear. You get out of your comfort zone, it's scary. But don't worry. You are part of the HWS family now. Reach out to any of us, any of the people surrounding you today. We got you. I can't wait to see who you will become. See you in class. So, our board chair, Tom Bizzuto, reflected that HWS taught him to become a permanent and perpetual student. He denoted that space in place matters, urging us to build community. Greg Vincent, said HWS ch changed his life, urging students to get involved and to be engaged, offering advice to be yourselves and build your own board of directors, to follow his parents' advice for the golden rule to treat others as we wish to be treated. Zach talked about Wynton Marsalis' speech with a metaphor of jazz. Sydney recalled her own tearful departure with her mother at orientation and how she took leaps of faith of involvement. And Professor Nan Crystal Irons told us you're here to transform. And then offering the advice and counsel to reach out to any of us. 
anyone surrounding you. All great advice from the board chair, faculty, students. So allow me a brief final reflection. The year ahead will be an important one for Hobart and William Smith Colleges. We will engage in important strategic thinking about our future, and that will inform the leadership change in plans for the next chapter of Hobart and William Smith history. All of this will be accomplished with a deeply engaged community that has worked tirelessly in recent years to revise a curriculum, prepare campus master plans, successfully present our curricular and co-curricular life to peer accreditors who praised our effort, manage our resources prudently in challenging times in higher ed, in a community that's thoughtfully considered how to enhance a genuine culture of respect. For me, as we enter this critical year, I take inspiration from our two founders, Bishop John Henry Hobart and William Smith, because I think they evidence our mission to prepare students to lead lives of consequence. Consider Bishop John Henry Hobart. He came here to what was then the western frontier of New York State, and he selected Geneva on Seneca Lake as a place to start a college. It was 1820, and he formed Geneva College. It was later renamed in his honor. But clearly, he was a visionary leader to imagine this charge. He would go on to preside over the New York Diocese and ordain the first African-American Episcopal priest in New York State, the second in the country. Consider William Smith. He was born in poverty in England, emigrated to the United States in his 20s, built a successful business here in Geneva, and when he was 88 years old, with little formal education, never married, and with no children, but inspired by the women's rights movement in nearby Seneca Falls, and Geneva's own Elizabeth Smith Miller, and Fitzhugh Miller, and Anna B. Comstock, those last names may sound familiar to Hill residents. William Smith wanted to found a women's college long before women in the United States could vote. And so for me, Bishop Hobart and William Smith share a common ideal of opening opportunities, broadening access, building community. And in this context, I'm reminded of the powerful words of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., who said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Both Bishop Hobart and William Smith represent our ideals of opening doors and opportunities to generations of, act, of students, bending that arc toward justice. While always a goal, has it always been perfect? Of course not. But today, we continue to commit ourselves to building an inclusive community imbued with a genuine culture of respect and honoring our heritage while imagining our future. And for me, that's the excitement of the year ahead, mindful of our proud heritage, but knowing, as President Obama has observed, that that arc doesn't bend on its own. And so campus visitors will add to our community dialogue in the year ahead. The author of The Common Read, Claudia Rankin, will be here to reflect on her book, Citizen as we discuss important topics of race and class. Senator Tom Harkin of Iowa, who introduced the Americans with Disabilities Act into the Senate, delivering parts of his speech in sign language so that his brother could understand it, will be on campus to reflect with us on access and disabilities. So in the classroom, outside the classroom, in student residences and the dining rooms, we have the privilege to collectively work together. I've been intrigued and been thinking about the theme of this year's Fisher Center for the Study of Women and Men. The theme this year is No Place Like Home. For in many ways, we 
can define that home. This 165 acre neighborhood that we all inhabit. A recent book by Harvard professor of government, Nancy Rosenblum, entitled Good Neighbors, The Democracy of Everyday Life, discusses the moral, ethical, and democratic dimensions of neighborliness, dating back to the very concept of good neighbor and John Winthrop's 1630 admonition to love thy neighbor. From literature to philosophical argument, Rosenblum underscores the imperative of home as a place with no exit and an underappreciated moral and psychological phenomenon. She writes, the phenomenon of neighbor relations so infuses American literature that our greatest writers and thinkers have written about neighbors. Neighbors are not just people living nearby, neighbors are our environment. They are the background to our private lives at home. So let's begin this year committed to our neighbors here on campus, committed to our neighbors here in Geneva and across the planet. Let us take inspiration from someone who arrived on this campus as a newcomer, face difficult times when accepted, face difficult times by her peers. And I speak, of course, about Elizabeth Blackwell. But she persevered and today remains a pride point for the colleges as the first American-trained woman physician. So each time you walk by the beautiful sculpture in the quad, perhaps each time you have a challenging day, especially walk by that sculpture, so brilliantly done by Professor Ted Obb, and take inspiration from Elizabeth Blackwell's life. Take inspiration and example from her hard work and perseverance. And recall the words that are engraved in granite at the base of the sculpture, for they were written from Geneva in 1847. I've always valued her writing in her words, and I hope they will have resonance for the classes of 2020 today and always. She wrote the following. I cannot but congratulate myself on having found at last the right place for my beginning. And so to the classes of 2020, the beginning you commence today flows from a long and proud heritage. Take advantage of every day here. Take advantage of every faculty and staff member here who are here for you. And take advantage of our web of alums and parents who are dedicated to your success. For this is a very special place and you will make it an even better place. Good luck. Please rise. And now, dear ones, as you begin a new academic year, go forth to renew and to transform this community. May you find blessing in your waking and in your sleeping, in your studying and in your teaching, in solitude and in friendship, in your work and in your play. Seek justice, love kindness, walk humbly, go in peace. This now concludes convocation and begins the 2015-2016 academic year. <laughs>